Good morning. Good morning. We are uh, the 50th Rifle Division. We are a Soviet uh, World War II and now recently pre-war uh, reenacting unit. We are mainly headquartered in the Midwest United States, uh, covering the states of Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and others. Um, we portray the Red Army, the Soviet Red Army, as it would have hopefully tried to appear in the field. Now, you have to bear with us. Our, our set today isn't exactly... Uh, uh, a muddy trench or something like that, but for the sake of video, it works much better. Um, I am Zach Williams, and what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through about 20 to 25 years of Red Army history, including, of course, the, everybody's favorite, the material culture. Um, but we will also hopefully talk a little bit about uh, economic history, social history, and cultural history. So we're about to cover about 25 years of Soviet history. Um, of course, we will always do the usual material culture. You want to know very much, I imagine, what type of boots I'm wearing, pouches, caps, etc., etc. But what we also hope to do is cover um, something not really covered in, in reenacting history. And this is one thing I hope sets us apart, is that we cover um, Soviet uh, culture, not just material culture, but what were the people, how were they thinking, how were they acting, what did they feel um, during the war and before the war, about the war itself, about Stalinism, about all of these topics. We hope to cover that in this a little bit here. We'll also discuss, of course, economic history. Uh, the Soviet Union transformed itself in these 25 years, and um, well, this is an economic. This is not an economics uh, video. I hope not. Um, it relates to everything we do. My appearance as a soldier of 1939 is going to be different, as you'll see, by improvements in the material conditions and of uh, production technology in the Soviet Union from a soldier of 1924, 1942, and 1945, which we'll all cover here. So with no further ado, let's start with our earliest uh, period, uh, Red Army soldier of the mid-1920s, uh, specifically 1924 to 27-ish. So to that end, I have our man Donovan here. He's going to walk you through what he's in and give you a little bit of a, uh, a social history as well. So I'll let him take over. Hello. So our recent sort of um, project as a club was interwar Soviet reenacting, 1924 to 1929 or so. Um, what really interest, interested us about this was this was a very momentous and changing time in the history of the Soviet Union, going from the old Tsarist reign into the new Soviet government. So after the Civil War, 1918-1922, the Soviet uh, government went towards their, um, their, sorry, went towards their goal of industrialization and moving forward as a new socialist communist nation. Now going from this, they were really battered and destroyed after the Civil War and the Tsarist reign, so a lot of resources and money didn't go to the army but more towards production and rebuilding. So the army of the time was often very poor off. Moving on through the 20s, the Soviet army tried to get away from the old Tsarist way of doing things. They went from officer ranks to service categories and um, <laughs> service categories. And trying to separate themselves from that Tsarist way, they often couldn't due to monetary restrictions, having to use mostly Tsarist stock, Tsarist surplus, and the whatnot. So looking on myself here, I use Tsarist pattern boots, uh, Tsarist canteens, Tsarist gas masks, Tsarist rifles. It's just about most of the Red Army's equipment during the 1920s was of Tsarist origin. Um, now, discipline during the 1920s was also a very big issue. Men were very unmotivated. They often would desert. Alcoholism was very prominent in the Army in the 1920s, and it, it was just hard to get the morale up to serve the nation. There was the territorial system within the USSR where men didn't go into a national army, but more in... Um, regional bases or uh, regional armies that they would train and work in instead of one large conglomerate. Uh, this system was often very poor. Men, hundreds of men would go into training and there would only be one or two uniforms to outfit them with. Um, it was very much a broken and gross and not very good system. Um, so this sort of lack of resources and um, equipment and sort of just overall manpower and will would be very lacking until the late 1930s where the five-year plans finally focused on strengthening the army in preparation for a possible war with Western 
powers. So as Donovan said, point out uh, astutely here, is that material conditions were lacking in the Red Army of the 1920s in both uh, a spirit, material of the spirit, to uh, quote a, um, a Soviet propaganda term of the 1930s, but also, of course, in physicality. But as he mentioned, as the five-year plans develop and the Soviet government decides that perhaps um, militarization, industrialization, or I'm sorry, this industrialization should feed militarization, was a good idea. So as a result, the 1930s, we see both a tightening of discipline standards in the Red Army and an uh, improvement in material conditions. Czarist gear, although still somewhat prevalent, um, is no longer leftover stocks. Instead, they are newly made in new built factories and issued by, in mass to the Red Army. Um, Czarist rifles are cast off and new Soviet rifles, although of course of the same pattern, are issued widely as well. That common myth of uh, one man, or I'm sorry, two men being issued one rifle during World War II um, is baseless. Uh, the Soviet system produced more than enough weapons. Now, of course, it didn't really produce some other things, which we'll talk about later, um, but weapons were typically in, uh, there was more than enough to go around. So in the 1930s, as part of the professionalization of the Red Army, we see new types of equipment that had never been issued before. Of course, the steel helmet. Um, a vital piece of equipment for any modern army. Uh, before then, the Red Army had been using, of course, as we've said before, leftover Tsarist helmets, uh, French Adrian helmets, and of course a helmet called, collectors call it the Solberg helmet. Of course, I think the real designation is just M17 helmet. Um, these were reused by the Red Army. They were collected from the battlefields and of the Civil War and of World War I, and depoted and issued to troops on a piecemeal basis. It wouldn't be until 1936 we introduced the aptly named model of 1936 helmet, and this would become the standard Soviet helmet. In addition, we see more advanced forms of carrying said gear. This is a Ranyets, a 1936 model. It's very similar if you, uh, to our military aficionados to a Tornister, a German Tornister. This replaces the canvas sack, uh, to use a unkind term for it, uh, used by the Red Army to carry their gear, as we see on our 1920s and again, uh, during wartime, it's just a canvas bag to hold your equipment. During the 30s, though, Soviet military planners believed that that was much too unelegant of a solution, and the Ranyets, the Tornister, was adopted instead. Um, this would have carried everything a soldier needed, including his personal items, extra sets of underwear, toothbrushes, matches, um, everything like that. And it's a very convenient package, although I will say these were very expensive to manufacture, very slow to manufacture. So as the Red Army expands the 1930s and discipline tightens and soldiers become more useful, um, these things are, there are never enough in supply. While there was enough rifles, certainly extra things that were considered superfluous, like bags to carry your stuff, were always in short supply. And in fact, these would be replaced fairly quickly once they realized that maybe we need to speed up production. Um, in addition to that, we see a standardization of equipment, pouches uh, based on the Tsarist model, although with added rings to support the backpack or adopted. Um, a new model of canteen with its own screw top, uh, designed to replace the Tsarist models. And um, at best, the gas mask he used would date to 1917, 1918. Um, one of the many areas of improvement of the Soviet system is that they decide that uh, gas warfare, as do all armies do in the 1930s, will become a problem, and every soldier, um, at least on paper, is going to be issued a new modern gas mask, one that is more reliable um, and, of course, much easier to use. This can tends to rattle around. When you wear it like this, and I'll wear it for you. Try to. Try to. These are very tightly fitting, as you would want with a gas mask. Oof. So, as you would want with a gas mask, very tightly fitting, uh, this is a very excellent model. It would have protected soldiers from blister agents, mustard gas, the common gases of the World War I. Uh, soldiers would also carry this into World War II. Um, we'll get to that in a minute, but our World War II soldier here still carries his gas mask bag, although it looks a little flat because he's probably discarded his mask, as many soldiers did against regulations. Um, but in the 1930s, every soldier would have been issued a gas mask because the Soviet government, as did every other government in the 1930s, greatly feared the return of poison gas in a new European conflict. So as the army matures and it comes into its own, it participates in actions against the Japanese in the Far East in the battles of Lake Hassan and Kalkin Gol. 
Um, and it, this, these battles prove the Red Army is somewhat up to the task. Of course, we cannot discuss the Red Army of World War II or of the pre-war period without discussing the officer purges, commonly known as the Yezov Shishina, the Yezhov phenomenon after the NKVD, the head of the secret police. Um, Soviet officers were targeted as they were feared to be um, anti-government. Uh, they were, there was a common fear in the Soviet Union of Napoleonism, that a uh, high-ranking general who was popular would seize power for himself, much like the famous dictator and tyrant Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, so as a result, the NKVD's efforts were, according to some, justly or many others unjustly unleashed on the Red Army. And um, there are very widely varying figures some Cold Warrior historians, people who did not have access to the archives when they were writing their histories would claim something ridiculous like half of Red Army officers were executed. Um, the truth is after more uh, archival study in the 1990s that it was closer to 30. And of that 30%, not all 30 were taken out and shot. Most men were retired. They were forced to leave the Army, clearing the way for a new generation of officers. Although, admittedly, these officers lacked a lot of the training needed to uh, to command large formations. They would have to learn these skills under fire in World War II with, and during the pre-war battles, unfortunately with uh, somewhat predictable results. But learn they did. Many men who were promoted in this fashion uh, were the famous generals Georgi Zhukov, who ended up commanding a regiment, the commanding a large army against the Japanese during the Battle of Kalkin Gol. And uh, Konstantin Rokosovsky, Rokosovsky, who uh, fell afoul of the Yezov Shishina and was in prison. However, his talents were, or once the charges were realized as baseless, he was released and would go on to serve with glory in both the Soviet and post-war Polish armies. So, I was telling no, we could trust Rokosovsky. There's an apocryphal story that um, Rokosovsky, unfortunately, because of his uh, uh, getting caught up in the terror, um, had suffered torture, as many people would. Um, and he had lost his fingertips, or um, fingernails, excuse me, as part of it. And so there was an apocryphal story that he was arguing with uh, Zhukov and Stalin about the best course of strategy late in World War II. And Stalin is reported to have made a remark that, you know what, I can trust Rokosovsky. He has nothing to lose. Just look at his fingers. Um, so a little bit of uh, brutal humor. Is it true? I don't know. It's probably apocryphal, as a lot of uh, attributions of quotes to famous people are. Um, but that should tell you that uh, these men would have had to serve under these conditions. And enlisted men did too. It's not just generals and majors and colonels who are caught up in this. So as World War II dawns, um, the Soviet Union initially cooperates with Nazi Germany in terms of its foreign policy. Unfortunately, they were left no other option. Western diplomatic efforts had isolated the Soviet Union. And again, there's a lot of debate about the official course of policy. But when the rest of the world is ignoring you, Unfortunately, you have to deal with what you have, and that led to very unfortunate things like the partitioning of Poland and the Soviet Union's um, supplying of Germany with raw materials that it desperately needed to continue the fight in 1939, 1940, and 41. Um, some people have argued why. Um, it certainly wasn't any kind of warm feeling between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. Um, some people have argued, well, Stalin was biding his time, waiting for to rebuild the Red Army. Other people have stated that they were seeking German technology, that the Germans were going to trade for resources. Um, it's a large area of interesting study that's being debated by historians now. What is indisputable, though, is that Nazi Germany betrays, uh, betrays if that's the right word, the Soviet Union on June 22, 1941, by invading it. Many people have cast the Nazi-Soviet war as a war uh, by the Nazis to liberate the peoples of the Soviet Union, the Ukrainians, Belarusians, Tatars, things like that. Other people have said that they were trying to get rid of communism, this great hydra of communism. Both of these theories are bunk. Uh, most, even the fringiest pro-German uh, historian will tell you that this is bunk. The Nazis invade the Soviet Union in 1941 for one reason. They want land. They want to gain uh, the fabled Lebensraum, as Hitler wrote about in uh, his book, um, Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf. In the 1920s, uh, I believe he wrote it in 22 or 24. So he had been saying for his whole political life that our destiny lies in the East against these, these Slavs, these people of the East, who the Nazis believed were not human. They were something less than human, subhuman. And that's why in 1941, when the Germans invade, they commit a war of unspeakable brutality and 
what is unarguably a genocide against the Soviet peoples. Um, they did not discriminate. If you were considered Soviet, you were considered something less. Um, because you either, even if you were not Slavic or whatever they want to call it, you had been tainted by communism and you were um, an enemy. So the Germans ripped their way through the Soviet Union, um, doing unspeakable horrors. By the times of the war, the Soviet Union would lose about 27 million of its population, of its people. Um, most of these are civilian deaths. These are not soldiers who risk their lives. Uh, of that 27 million, I believe something like 19, 18, 19 of those mil 27 million are civilian deaths, caused either directly by German action or the action of Germany's allies, Romania, Hungary, um, and to a lesser extent, Finland, or by the murdering squads of Nazi Germany. So to resist this onslaught, um, it would not be men like me. Most of the pre-war Soviet army would have been destroyed in 1941 by German action and we've left a new class of soldier to fight this war. And we're going to introduce that subject now. So this would be the Soviet soldier of the mid-war period, 1940, late 1941 to 19 through, all the way through 1942. So I'll turn it over to him. Uh, yeah, as he said, I represent a soldier of the mid-war period, as we call it. Uh, again, 41, 42, the situation has stabilized somewhat after Barbarossa. Uh, the Red Army is by no means out of danger, but it's uh, stabilized. You know, the German advance has been halted, at least for now. Um, and as a result of this is that, again, as he mentioned, the pre-war army had been basically destroyed uh, in the opening months of the war. Uh, I believe the Germans took around 4 million prisoners in the opening months, and uh, there's an interesting fact that I always remember is that on any given day in late 1941 during the winter, more Soviet POWs died um, than Western Allied POWs through the entire war. Just to give you an idea of the scale of, one, the operations in the East, uh, but also the German uh, cruelty in the script. As you mentioned, the Soviet people were not thought of as humans. They were subhumans. Uh, to Nazi Germany according to Nazi racial ideology uh, and as a result the prisoners were treated very poorly um, they were less prisoner of war camps and more cattle pens where they were herded in and basically left to die so like I said it's uh, I believe the exact statistic is if you were in the in the Red Army in 1941 there was a 75 percent chance you would be dead by 1943 so grim times for sure um, and my equipment kind of reflects, reflects that grim reality, whereas before you can see the pre-war uniform is somewhat a uh, little bit more ornate. He has much nicer collar tabs. These are just simple, plain material, if you even got any at all. He has two pouches. I'm equipped with just one, as you can see here. Um, canteen would have remained the same. The gear fundamentally wouldn't have changed. It just would have been issued perhaps less of it. However, again, as he mentioned, rifles were never in short supply. The Mosin Nagant, the famous rifle, was actually stopped making them in 1944 as they had enough. But neither here nor there. Um, and my equipment also represents um, perhaps also some foreign influences. Um, putties had been issued, again, the world, are famous for World War I, but also were issued in the Red Army uh, as long with the side as the jackboots. Uh, but as the war progressed, you could actually see uh, these boots are actually not a Russian model. These are actually British boots, which would have been received via the Lend-Lease pipeline, which was aid that was given by mostly the United States, but also uh, Great Britain, given to the Soviet people as well. Um, funnily enough, these British boots were actually universally hated. They did not like British boots, so uh, I'm comfortable, but maybe they weren't as much back then. <laughs> Um, again, the equipment is simplified. It's the same leather belt they would have always had. Uh, the gas mask bag, again, my best gas mask is nice and flat because soldiers realized, okay, gas maybe isn't coming. I could use this bag to do something else with it. I can store food, water, that sort of deal. This was against regulations, and if you were caught, you would be punished, but it happened regardless, and especially as the war went on. Um, Equipment-wise, I'm actually fairly well equipped. I have the semi-automatic SVT rifle. Um, and this was a, again, Soviet attempt at a self-loading rifle. Uh, it actually had more influence than one would think, as the Germans pretty much directly copied it for their Gewehr 43 semi-automatic rifle. However, just like the German one, there really were not enough of these to go around. The pre-war plan had been to replace the bolt-action Mosin Nagant with these rifles. Again, uh, they're, however, they're fairly expensive to make compared to the relatively simple bolt action. And this, even before the war, even before, uh, you know, the emergency of the war starts, 
there's not nearly enough of these to go around. So, and especially as the war goes on, these get scarcer and scarcer because the mosin nagant bolt action is just far simpler to make and to issue um, at large. Um, however, though, it was a relatively good design. It was just held back by the fact that the Soviet Union was in an emergency and it needed to focus on what it could do at the moment. And again, that's reflected in my gear as well. Again, I have a great coat. Uh, this would have been issued all year round. We've been carried in this called the Scott Corral. Uh, simple kit, you know, with a nice mess kit compared to the German style mess kit on the Tornister there. Um, and that's the whole thing is it's all about economization. You see this in Soviet society as well during the time period. You know, uh, factories had to be moved out of the reach of German. You know, most Soviet industry was in Western Russia, which is where the Germans invaded. So a lot of stuff had to be moved as far away as possible, as fast as possible. And that's why you often see, you often hear tales of factories, uh, the machines being unloaded in crates and open fields and the factories getting to work. No walls, no roof, just the, the steel punch is there and you have to work it because they need rifles now. They need uh, metal items now. They need everything right now. Uh, the Red Army expands greatly during this time. I believe the pre-war was, was what? Four-ish million. Four-ish million. It would eventually expand uh, by the end of the war in 45 to about 11 million. So again, your army is almost doubling in size, or is doubling in size, while, you know, the worst war in the history of human, uh, human warfare is going on. So they managed to do a lot more with a lot less compared to their pre-war designs and that's reflected you know i'm equipped very simply you see photos of you know germans and gis with fairly you know complex webbing systems very full belts nice backpacks uh and that's not the case what i'm carrying you know is basically everything on my person however just because it is simple and it is relatively scarce does not mean that it's junk you know everything is very well made it's solid canvas and leather um, it's just very simple because it has to be. You know, the front um, of the Soviet Union uh, runs from roughly Leningrad to Grozny, so to speak. And during that time, that's that's a big area. That's basically what? That's like from Canada down to Florida. Or yeah, something. from Canada to Florida. So they have to cover that front. So as a result, you can't have nice things like this nice Ranyets. You have to have a simple canvas sack. But frankly, it's good enough. You know, you don't need super nice things when you're just trying to man the line. Um, yeah. And as the time goes on, you know, the Soviet army becomes sort of almost better at certain things than the German one. You know, the German armies uh, portray this elite formation, um, which to a certain extent is true. It has its basis in reality, but it was, of course, distorted by Cold War historians. Um, but as time goes on, the Red Army actually becomes fairly good at things that Germany is quote-unquote legendary for. Blitzkrieg warfare, uh, you know, combined arms warfare with armored vehicles and concentration. Uh, of course, Germans use that to great effect, but by the end of the war, and even during this period, during operations uh, such as the relief of Stalingrad, uh, Soviet commanders like Zhukov, as mentioned, become very good at combined arms warfare. What was the term? Uh, Deep ships. battle. Deep battle doctrine, is, or it was, it was called, it was uh, to reduce it a little bit, the Soviet version of Blitzkrieg, you know, combined arms warfare, tanks, airplanes, all acting in unison. And despite, again, the fact, you know, the Soviet army is portrayed as this mindless horde, uh, they managed to out-Blitzkrieg the Germans, again, so to speak. Again, Blitzkrieg is a kind of a historical term, kind of made up, but uh, the Soviet Union gets quite good at this. Uh, and by the end of the war, they're conducting these operations that would have made Guderian blush, you know, in the, in the late 1930s. Um, however, we will continue on to that late war period now. I'll let uh, Zach take back over and we'll discuss some of the changes during the late war period, 43 to 45. So as the war is turning, right, so commonly historians say that um, Stalingrad, the Battle of Stalingrad, is the turning point. And for the most part, I would agree, you could argue semantics, but that's neither here nor there. As the war shifts, the Soviets are on, no longer on the back foot. They are triumphant. They are moving west into uh, German-occupied Soviet Union, into Poland, and finally into the Reich itself, uh, striking at, um, it would end the war in Prague and, in, of course, in Berlin. The Soviets famously get to capture the German capital. Um, so as we do that, we would have the men here who would be the ones storming the Reichstag. As you can see, the uniforms have changed. Now, small aesthetic things, but they are worth noting in a social context. 
Um, they switch uniform styles. These here, now while well, technically I am, the Russian term for this is gymnast, gymnastorica. Gymnastorica. Um, we have different types of them. I, as you guys can see, I have these nice collars. He has a collar as well, although his tabs are a little bit lighter. What we have here is a return to a more czarist influence, shockingly enough that the progressive people's army of the Soviet Union would hearken back to the reactionary dinosaurs of the czarist era. But indeed they did. It was done as a kind of callback to famous, unfortunately it was more of a focus on Russian heroes, the great generals of the Napoleonic War, Suvorov, uh, Bagration. Um, and that was all done as a callback to more, uh, to give morale to the men, to inspire them to continue fighting. So we see uh, the, re the elimination of collar and the reintroduction of the hated pogoni, or shoulder boards, where rank is shown instead of on the collar. Um, these themselves are kind of an interesting thing to study as well, because in the interwar period, they were made fun of. Um, you could reduce all of Tsarist tyranny and backwardness and everything into the Pogoni. Um, and it's funny they would be reintroduced. Um, but indeed they were, and of course this would remain a part of Soviet uniform heraldry until 1991. So they came back and they never really went away. Um, and this was done, of course, to inspire. To inspire to say, hey, we're not, you know, we are the Soviet Union, we're our own thing, but we have this rich history to look back upon. Kind of controversial. A lot of the minorities of the Soviet Union, Turkmen, um, Poles, Ukrainians and things, would have had very little in common with this. But, of course, it's feeding into the majority Russian population. This would have been something that would have caused great pride, right? And even in non-Russian um, uh, ethnicities, we still see some of that pride as being cast as pro-Soviet. You know, we're not Turkmen, we're not Uzbeks, we're not Ukrainians, we're Soviets. Um, and the uniform kind of reflects that. One thing we also see in terms of actually getting back to material conditions is a vast issuance of submachine guns. While before, uh, the mainstay of the Soviet army would have been the rifle, and in fact, it still really is the Mosin rifle, submachine guns, including the PPS uh, submachine gun here, and of course the PPSH, would have become uh, very common in certain units of the Red Army. Uh, shock companies, about 100 men, would be issued submachine guns, and these men would do great, great work at close range, but when you think about late war combat, it's happening in cities like Berlin, it's happening in um, Prague, it's happening in all these close-in areas, and as a result, people armed with these would have had an edge over uh, Germans or their fellow Soviet soldiers armed with bolt-action rifles. Um, we should state, obviously, that the standard German weapon of World War II was a bolt-action rifle. Despite the uh, 1960s films that tell us that every man had an MP40, the reality was uh, bolt action rifles, as it was for the Soviet Army. Not every man had a PPSH, not every man had a PPS, because rifles still had their uses. You know, not all combat is going to happen at 10 yards. Sometimes it's further, and you, for that, you need a rifle. So, the Soviet Union would end the war, um, as uh, Dylan had stated, by performing excellent maneuvers that would have been not out of place in Barbarossa of 1941. They encircle the entire German, an entire German army group of hundreds of thousands of men um, in the summer of 1944, Operation Bagration, named after a famous Tsarist general. Um, and from there on, the war is basically over for Germany. There is no way so they can recover the initiative and there is no stopping the momentum and the admitted fury of the Red Army. Um, as we've mentioned earlier, these Germans, as they tore through the Soviet Union, committed unspeakable atrocities. Civilians murdered, raped, villages destroyed. And unfortunately, um, when you have a population that was enraged by seeing these sites as they move through um, German-occupied territory, there was, perhaps understandably, perhaps not, a certain lack of sympathy for the German and German civilian population. While some historians have claimed falsely that the Red Army, as an official policy, encouraged rape, encouraged murdering of civilians, um, this is simply untrue. But it happened. It's an unfortunate fact, but it did happen. Um, maybe millions of German civilians would suffer cruelties by the Red Army. However, unlike in other armies, maybe except the American, Soviet soldiers were punished for these crimes. Rape was punishable, I believe, by death in the Red Army, um, if you were caught. Now, can we talk about that there was a culture of not turning each other in? Unfortunately, yes. But I would like to, we just want to say to contextualize what is going on. It wasn't simply an, as many historians have pointed in the past, an Asiatic horde coming in, like, uh, would have more in common with Genghis Khan than with uh, a 20th century army. Um, 
while it did happen, of course, it's a little exaggerated, but also, too, we're not denying it. Unfortunately, it was a part of war. Um, but it would be these men, uh, men who survived 41, men who survived 42, and all, survived all the great battles of those that would stand triumphant over Nazi Germany in 1945. With Germany defeated, the Soviet Union wages a decisive battle against the Japanese, some historians arguing causing the Japanese surrender, maybe more so than the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, whatever that result is, the end result is, is that the Soviet Union ends World War II as a superpower. The Soviet Union is one of the world's two superpowers, along with the United States, and they are the decisive actor of World War II. They suffer the most casualties, unfortunately, but they also inflict 70-ish percent of casualties on the German army. If it wasn't for uh, Zhukov's divisions uh, fighting at Kursk and fighting at, um, in Belarusia in 1944, the excuse me, Allied landings in Normandy and Italy would have been opposed by the entirety of the German army. Um, so the Soviets played their part of the war. They paid the price, unfortunately. But they emerged from the war um, maybe not stronger, but certainly more prominent on the world stage. And that, of course, leads us to the Cold War, but I'm going to have to end it there because I don't have another seven hours to talk about that. So we want to thank you guys for tuning in today. So, guys, hopefully this was something that interested you. We um, are a unit. Uh, we are the 50th Rifle Division. In addition to being the 50th, which is the local contingent in the Midwest, we are also a member of Military History Club Istoshnik, which is a pan- U.S. Uh, grouping of Soviet units that kind of come together, have similar standards, and of course enforce those standards on our membership. If this is something that interests you, you can find us on Facebook, uh, on the, either under Military History Club Istoshnik, um, or under the 50th Rifle Division. Um, we're of course always looking for new members. Um, we always want to expand our numbers and hopefully expand the number of people who share a similarly historical and materially based outlook and interpretation of Second Great War. Thank you, guys.